Live from the Talking Joe Studios. It's Talking Joe. Talking Joe Weekly Podcast. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe thought we would last. Talking Joe is there. Finding each other like a marriage vows. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe is the code name for a completely untrained special podcast force. Its purpose, to produce a regular comic review show while breaking and replacing a series of presenters from across the world. Talking Joe. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe. We are on our soapbox. Nobody seems to care. Fighting for fandom wherever there's trouble, but the podcast's on the air. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe. Talking Joe. Talking Joe is on the air. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, is for horses. It's me, Mark, and welcome to Talking Joe, the best and longest running dedicated G.I. Joe comics podcast. Uh, that's what me and Tim think anyway. If you're new to the show, you can find the details over at the website talkingjoe.co.uk. Today we are continuing our look at the G.I. Joe disavowed era, the Devil's Due Run, and specifically the G.I. Joe Frontline issues 5 to 8, Icebound, which were published by Devil's Due back in 2003. Significantly, the first big arc that isn't uh, written by Josh Blaylock or Larry Hammer. Now, uh, we have got a very special guest, but before we get to him, let me introduce my co-host. On point, it's a real American Tim. It's Tim Finn. Hello, Mark, and hello, listeners. Now we are going to introduce our second co-host. Uh, no, we're not, because he's not here. He is under the weather, unfortunately. Uh, Jay Cordray could not Charlie Mike. He is resting up at home. So uh, best wishes to you, Jay. Hope you are on the mend uh, by the time the show goes out. Um, if you're not, we'll be quite concerned. So <laughs> fingers crossed by the time you hear this, you will be uh, A-OK. Um, but our special guest. All right, stop. Whatever you're doing, TJ's back. The airwaves were chewing, rocking a GI Joe podcast interview special. Questions will be asked. TJ interview. TJ interview. TJ interview. Joining us for this show is none other than the writer of these issues. It's Dan Jolly. Dan uh, started writing prof professionally at age 19 and, and has worked in comics for most of the major American publishers, such as DC for uh, working on f the likes of Firestorm, Marvel on Doctor Strange, Dark Horse, uh, such as on Aliens, and has branched out into licensed property film novelizations such as Star Trek and Iron Man, and original novels including the middle grade urban fantasy series Five Elements and the urban sci-fi Grey Widow Trilogy. Dan, has st uh, Dan started writing for video games in 2007 on titles such as Transformers, War for Cybertron, Prototype 2 and Dying Light. He lives in northwest Georgia and he's here now. Hi, Dan. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Did did I cover everything there? What 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 was there anything big that I should have said that I missed there in that uh, plotted history of uh, your writing career? I I mean you know there are individual titles that uh, might have been mentioned but don't have to be. I think you covered all the major bases. Uh, excellent stuff. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's a long long career now. So so um, fitting it all in one sentence is uh, no mean uh, mean feat. So I guess. Beyond that plotted history, uh, what what uh, we're talking specifically about a kind of G.I. Joe uh, and uh, your your frontline arc here, but kind of what uh, what was the kind of the journey that got you to the point uh, where you were writing this this book? And you can start back as far as you far as you you, you like. So in 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 kind of 
how you how you started writing and uh so your writing um secret history but but also uh <laughs> if there was a an inter- an interest in gi joe that stretched back to childhood as as well um so um i always like to make stuff up <laughs> as a kid <laughs> uh you know b- basically as soon as i learned to read and started reading stories i wanted to start writing stories mm. as well and um uh, so I'd begun writing short stories, and when I was 19, I uh, visited my older sister at college, and um, while I was there, I went over to the local mall to the video arcade, because th- that's how long ago this was. Uh, and I was uh, playing video games, you know, and uh, the arcade attendant was this really cute girl. And I started talking to her and wound up asking her out, and on our first date, I was telling her that I like to write short stories, and she said, well, have you ever considered writing comic books? And no, I hadn't. I mean, I had grown up reading comic books thanks to my older brother, uh, because he brought them home from college. Uh, My brother and sister are are, um, 11 and 9 years older than I am. Oh, wow. So when I was, you know, 6 and 7, my big brother had gone off to Georgia Tech, and uh, he would... He was not a collector, he was strictly a reader, and he would bring home these huge paper boxes, like like Xerox paper boxes, stuffed with comic books. <laughs> not bagged and boarded, just like literally stuffed into this big box. Uh, and he'd bring a big box home just about every time he came home to visit, so, uh, so I was reading comics. Uh, but I told her, no, I hadn't ever thought about writing them, and she said, well, I know a couple of comic book artists that I could introduce you to. Um, <laughs> nice. And uh, that turned out to be Craig Hamilton and Tony Harris, who wow. who lived there in, in uh, the town where my sister was going to college. Uh, so I started talking to them, showed them some of my short stories, and they decided that I, you know, didn't walk on my knuckles. And uh, <laughs> they introduced me to some comic book editors. And the editors are the, the you know, the gatekeepers the firewalls, the decision makers. Uh, an editor who likes you can give you work. And uh, mm-hmm. so, uh, yeah, the the first two things that I did, um, one was a Vampirella story for Harris Comics for Melanie Crawford Chadwick. And, um, and then the second one was Dan Thorsland at Dark Horse. And that's where I got started with the uh, Aliens franchise. And it's just kind of gone from there. Dan Thorsland was really super instrumental in teaching me how to write a script. And in fact, he was, I didn't realize that, that I was being tested, but the first conversation we had, <laughs> he said, uh, okay, let me, let me read you a little bit of a script here. The, the panel one, uh, a, a man in his 30s, with uh, three days worth of stubble and he's wearing a leather jacket and he's uh, he's getting off of a Greyhound bus and he's got an oblong wooden box under his arm. Caption. The stranger carries an oblong wooden box under his arm. And I started laughing because that's terrible. <laughs> and <laughs> because, you know, if the art shows you that the guy's got a box under his arm, then you don't need to put it in the caption. And um, the fact that I laughed at that made Dan Thorsland, um, I mean, he, it, it uh, made him realize that I maybe had kind of a good instinct for what would make a good comic book script, I guess. Anyway, uh, he, he started tutoring me, more or less, uh, at the same time that he gave me a couple of assignments. And that, that first one turned out to be a little 16-page alien story that showed up in the anthology series that was literally called Dark Horse Comics. Mm, and, yeah, uh, I've and, been reading it at the time. And yeah, it, uh, it, it went the, my career kind of went from there. Um, because I had done comics work uh, at uh, Megacon in Tampa, Florida, a, a guy named Scott C. Ensign, who made his living writing licensed property novels, like media tie-in novels, um, approached me, and he had read some of my comics and really liked them, and, uh, and he said, you know, I, got, I have a contract to do a Star Trek novel, but I'm really up against it on the deadline. Would you like to co-write it with me? And that way it'll save time. Um, mm. 
and um, I, I, I said what freelancers say, given any opportunity like that, <laughs> yes, 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 I would like to do that. Um, I hadn't written prose in years at that point and wasn't even sure that I still knew how, but um, it turned out that I did. Were you familiar with Star Trek, or did you have to do a quick crash course or fake it? I was not familiar with the property that uh, that this was focused on. It was the Starfleet Corps of Engineers, and that was a whole separate crew, whole separate set of characters. Um, those are the people who come in and, like, clean up the debris after a starship battle or um, when... Q has messed up the ecosystem on a planet or something, and the the SCE comes in and uh, diverts the flow of lava from. You know, they're, they're the cleanup people. Now, at the <laughs> at the same time, I, I have to guess there had either been just a handful of novels featuring these kinds of characters previously, and maybe a mention in one episode but not not as not much established canon for these characters correct so your so your crash course wouldn't have been too arduous um that's true that's true uh i I did two things with scott that was one of them the other one was we did a um a novel based on the tv show angel and in both cases scott was very much the senior partner uh you know because i was uh very green and um, I took all my cues from him. So um, the characters in SCE that I didn't really have a good grip on, um, he he could do the heavy lifting on those parts. Hmm. Um, and <laughs> there was one of them was a uh, an alien, uh, and you could choose how to pronounce his name. It looks like Solomon, but could also be read Solo Man, S O L O M A N. Anyway. Uh, to this day, I'm not sure what Solomon looks like, because <laughs> it never said in the in the material, and uh, and I didn't have the time. Like all the the the, the half of my novel, or my my half of the novel didn't really focus on him too much, and so you know I was just like typing away madly, and uh, yeah. So I guess there was a pretty good amount of faking it in that one too. I was much more familiar with the Angel uh, canon. Uh, having watched all of the show up to that point right that helps yeah so um uh, i i'm thinking this is the uh the very early 2000s at this point what is your familiarity with gi joe uh i had watched the cartoon um i had my, my knowledge of the comics was pretty minimal but i had watched every episode of the cartoon that i could find um I guess it came out when I was a young teenager, I suppose, or or almost teen. And um, I loved it when it came out. It was uh, not really like many of the cartoons that I had grown up watching. And one of the big things that I really appreciated about it is that uh, it seemed like a requirement for other cartoons even if they were kind of serious, to have some kind of idiotic comic relief. Uh, You know, the the Orko, the Orko factor. Uh, It was like the the creators didn't didn't trust that kids could handle serious subject matter unless there was some kind of just bone-stupid comic relief to come in and (laughs) gilligan things up. You know, and uh, G.I. Joe didn't seem to have that. And I, I just, I, you know, I couldn't, couldn't get enough of it. So, um, and and especially when the stuff with uh, Cobra Law came out, uh-huh. and and the character Globulus showed up on screen, <laughs> I was like, this, is it just me or is this guy a little bit Lovecraftian? You know, <laughs> this is this is like getting into some like approaching body horror, and uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was just. I was just fascinated. Yeah, the stakes are much higher in that story. Mm-hmm. And the, the tone, sort of the emotional stakes are... I mean, it's not just an end-of-the-world plot, but sort of everything about that. The, that that bit of animation is, is on a uh, higher scale. So um, 
Did, were you aware of, of G.I. Joe coming back to comics in 2001? Were you aware that it had been away for several years? Were you aware of Devil's Due as this studio that was publishing through Image? Uh, yes, yes. Um, and I, I was sort of scrambling around trying to find work as a, a freelancer does. And uh, I, I was aware of it and was, was actually doing some work for Devil's Due. But I had not picked up on the new comics all that much. Uh, I remember I read the first issue, and uh, and you know it, it looked great. Uh, I liked it, and um, you know when I finally got the chance to be a part of it on uh, uh, Frontline, of course I jumped at it. But uh, at the time, I believe I was writing Voltron and Micronauts for mm, de- for yeah, de- in. In the back of these issues, it's uh, trailing your your Voltron issues, so they must have come out at the same time, essentially. Yeah, so I, I so I have jumped ahead a step. Let me let me jump back. Um, how how did you start writing Micronauts and Voltron? Um, so I met the Devil's Due gang, uh, Josh Blaylock primarily, and uh, his his then girlfriend, whose name I believe was Susan, and. Um, uh, some of the other some of the other guys at a at a con, you know, you go to cons, you're a scrambling freelancer. You go to cons, you try to meet new people and uh, pick up jobs and make connections. And so that was a, a connection that I made at a at a show. And um, let's see, what was it? I, I think I was trying to pitch them some original stuff. And they weren't really interested in that because, you know, they had uh, these these licenses, these very, very well-known licenses, and they wanted to capitalize mm-hmm. on those. What I definitely remember is that um, they had mentioned Voltron, and I told them how big a Voltron fan I was. And after the show, like a week after the show, I was back in here in Georgia, and I got an email from Josh Blaylock, and the subject line was, Will you form the head? and it was and it was him offering me voltron and uh that was um that was that might have been the first ongoing series that i ever got i think i think it was and so you know i skipped and danced around the apartment you know because it was <laughs> finally getting getting some uh, some steady work doing what I wanted to do with my career uh and uh I had done I don't remember how much Voltron but there was a creative shake up with the Micronauts team and um uh he he then wrote me back wrote me again and said hey do you think you could take on writing Micronauts too and uh you know not only was that an amazing offer another ongoing series and effectively like doubling my income you know it, it was just uh continuing on the uh, like i i thought i had arrived uh, basically i was like oh my god it's all working it's after years of <laughs> years of uh knocking on doors and you know trying to to get some steady gigs now I've got two, and this is this is just it's it's it's, uh, it's unbelievable. And I said, sure, of course, of course, I'll, I'd I'd love to do Micronauts. And he said, okay, we need the next script on Tuesday. <laughs> it was Thursday, and uh, so <laughs> I dug in and did all of the research and wrote a script and turned it in Tuesday morning, and we were we were off to the races. So um, you know, I was I was handling those two series. And then the uh, they announced this G.I. Joe Frontline series. So I was a member of a comic book studio at the time. It was I was basically the one writer with a whole bunch of artists. It was called Jolly Roger. That was it was not named after me. It was already an existing <laughs> thing when I joined. Um, right. Well, yeah. Um, so what's what's the. Uh, What's the the uh, language rating on this? What the, how how far can I go as far as uh, foul language? As far as you want. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Um, 
at one point I went to, to Tony Harris, who was, uh, uh, he had co-founded the studio and uh, when I joined, the other co-founder had left and so he was like the head of the studio, more or less. And uh, at one point I said, hey, Tony, um, I noticed that some mail came and it was to Jolly Roger, but they spelled it with an E before the Y, which is how I spelled my name. Do people think that this studio was named after me? And he said, yes, you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's, that's our F-bomb for the, for the recording so, session. Uh, uh, <laughs> just, yeah, um, if it was you and a guy called Roger, that would just be perfect. <laughs> How many uh, at at its peak? How many artists were at the studio? Oh, let's see, like six, six or seven, I think. Okay. And this is and this it's... a physical studio, like a workspace, or is it a virtual collective? No, we had an actual physical workspace in downtown Macon, Georgia. And there are like how many how many desks? How many rooms? There was one big bullpen, one okay. big bullpen, and then. There was one room that wasn't really used in the back, and I went in and cleaned it out and turned it into my writing cave. <laughs> was there uh, was there any kind of manager or comptroller? Was it just the artists and the the writer? Um, well, it kind of eventually evolved into me being sort of like the the coordinator. Um, I, I would say that was because I was the least disorganized. <laughs> of of the crew and you know i would keep track of like rent and um uh the 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 credit line to the art supply store and stuff like that so the studio um besides tony harris the other artists it was people who worked on this arc right this gi joe arc right so yes yes the the thought was uh that like since voltron and micronauts were going well um that um, what this was going to be would be a, a, a like, you know how you see a, a Spike Lee movie and it, it's, and it says, like, a Spike Lee joint. And we wanted to have a series of projects, and it could say a, a Jolly Roger Studios joint, though we simply wouldn't call it that because, you know, we weren't that cool. <laughs> and uh, so, like, what the intention was was that me continuing in the more or less coordinator position that, that I would be like the de facto editor on it and and write the script and um, other members of the studio would come in and, and do the art and if uh, if the one on the front line went well then we could pitch more projects like that to Devil's Do and then maybe to other people and um, uh, maybe start doing some original stuff um, what the whole experience did for me was make me realize that I don't ever, ever, ever want to be a comic book editor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it turned out pretty well, but uh, I just really enjoy being a writer. I don't enjoy um, putting together, you know, you hear people say... Uh, trying to get creative people to, to come together on something is like herding cats. And there was a little bit of cat herding going on there. That I mean, the project turned out well, but I, uh, I, I wouldn't do anything like that again. Yeah, I mean, the, the mix of people sort of credited in the, in the, in the credits, you know, sort of the, a number of pencilers, three, I think three credited pencilers, two credited inkers, three color uh credited colorists two credited letterers sort of speaks a little bit to to some wrangling in the in the background to to make sure that this thing happens to to schedule yeah yeah well the the original intention as as i recall was that uh drew johnson and i came up with the like general idea and then i wrote the scripts and uh, Drew was going to do the pencils for the modern day part, and uh, uh. Tom Feaster was going to do the pencils for the flashbacks. And I think that, um, like, in order to sort of push the get get the ball over the uh, into the end zone, 
Devil's Due brought in a couple of uh, additional guys to to like finish up a couple of things. Dan, you lettered the first two chapters. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you talk about your uh, experience as as a letterer? Well, that started because of a project that uh, that Tony and Ray and I did uh, called Obergeist. That was uh, a mini series that we did for Top Cow. It was supposed to be a DC. We got uh, we got the contract. It was it was like set to go at DC, and then Paul Levitz, the publisher read the plot and said no way in hell are we doing this book so <laughs> so we uh, i had like all six scripts written and tony and ray had done like the first two issues and so we shopped it to other places and top cow immediately picked it up so we had an idea once the first six issues were done to do like an addendum thing like a, a, a postscript one issue called The Empty Locket, and it was going to be uh, a little bit of background for the main character and sort of tie together elements from the main story. And uh, Top Cow was like, well, yeah, yeah, um, we can do that, but the, we don't, if I recall correctly, we don't quite have the budget that we did for the first ones. And, and uh, I said, well, um, we know... Uh, a letterer who's done a ton of work for for DC and Marvel and maybe we can convince him to give me a crash course in the in the simpler aspects of lettering and uh, and then you know I'll just do that for free and and we can get our our uh, postscript published so um, <clears throat> I'm blanking on the guy's name super nice guy does a ton of work for DC and and I, f I feel terrible that I can't remember what his name is at the at the moment but uh, he got on the phone with me and um, this is predicated on having the program Adobe Illustrator that's um, as far as I know g generally the the modern lettering tool to use and he gave me a, a very quick crash course in how to do just very basic word balloons I didn't get into the sound effects uh, the sound effects for that issue were actually baked into the art, but the the dialogue and the captions, uh, I did those for budgetary reasons. But it was a great thing to do because doing that as a comic book writer vastly increased my appreciation for where to put the words on the page. Up to that point, I had had specific ideas about which balloons were connected to which and how... Uh, sentences being broken up in certain ways and um, I would actually encourage as many writers as possible to learn to do some lettering uh, just because it, it will help your it will help your scripts and uh, another letterer Richard Starkings who owns the lettering house Comicraft and actually creates a bunch of fonts has a really really good online tutorial uh, at uh, a site called Balloon Tales that's T-A-L-E-S, balloontails.com. And you can go there, and, and it breaks it all down using Illustrator, how to do modern comic book lettering. So uh, I've, I've kind of kept it up a little bit. I um, On my website, I have a, a newsletter you can sign up for, and the newsletter consists of uh, photos of me and... Uh, occasional guest uh, guest authors and my cats and uh, we're all and it's like a it's like a comic strip thing so it's uh, me with like word balloons and sound effects and stuff like that so i know that our listeners want to get into the meat of the story and the art but i i i'm fascinated so i'm going to ask another question so you lettering issues five and six of gi joe frontline was that also about keeping the budget down? Was that scheduling? Or did you sort of creatively want to do that step? I think it was just to, to try to keep everything in-house as much as possible. Okay. Um, like, we, we wanted to um, to present Jolly Roger as like a one-stop shop kind of place. Like, uh, uh, you want a comic book done? We can do everything to do with it right here. Like a packager? Yeah. Like like the like the like the sweatshops in the forties. 
<laughs> no, I mean the comic book sweatshops in the forties. I'm. It sounds like a joke, but I, I just mean it's like the thing. comic book sweatshops in the in the forties, like the like the Eisner and Elder Studio, because uh, um, there were. Yes, because there were there were editors hungry to fill like sixty four pages of monthly comics, and 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 there was money anyway. So, um, <laughs> okay, so. Um, uh so did you to go back a half step um you pitched this to to devil's do you said hey we have i have an idea we have an idea for this spinoff title right yes okay and um did your pitch get um approved or did you make changes to it before you went ahead as i recall it got approved immediately uh, that was not at all the case with a couple of other pitches to do with with Devil's Due, but uh, but this one, um, uh, Arctic Research st- Station, mysterious past with Duke. They just were like, "Yep, yep, sounds good, do it." As as someone who knew GI Joe foremost through the the cartoon and less less the the comic, I guess possibly the the idea of being the one of the very first writers outside of Larry Hammer and uh, Josh Blaylock tackling a, a, you know, a significant chunk of story perhaps was a less daunting prospect than than maybe someone who was, uh, you know, more more had it uh, running through their veins <laughs> from uh, <laughs> from knowing the knowing the you know following the the comics and and you know really sort of being you know so more you know. Having it is a greater nostalgia factor from their childhood. Perhaps. Well, um, really, one of the purposes of this, aside from presenting Jolly Roger as a, a packager, uh, I was essentially auditioning for the role of continuing G.I. Joe writer because Bla- Josh Blaylock had let it be known that he was going to write the series up to a certain point and then he was going to hand it off to someone. Aha. Uh-huh. And um, I really wanted to be the person that he handed it off to. (laughs) And it came down to me and uh, a friend of mine named Brandon Jerwa. And um, uh, Blaylock asked each of us to turn in, like, what we would do with the series. And uh, so Brandon and I each wrote up like pitches, like uh, um, overviews of where we would take things and how we would approach things. And um, uh, Josh liked Brandon's better, and so Brandon got the job, and I did not. And I've uh, <laughs> tried not to be uh, jealous and bitter about that. <laughs> do you still do you still have that document? No, no, it's lost to the ages. Okay. Do you have some um, Do you have some recollections as to to what your pitch involved? Uh, not, I can't recall right now. Uh, maybe if I thought about it for a while. Did uh, you have any concern, uh, with Voltron and Micronauts and maybe in GI Joe and aliens, uh, that you'd be, um, stuck uh, known for only licensed work that you wouldn't be able to write other kinds of comics? Like if editors wouldn't hire you? Um, not, not, not really. Uh, there are tons of comic writers who only ever write licensed stuff. You know, I mean, that's because that's basically what you're doing if you're working at Marvel or or DC. Um, most of the time, 99% of the time, you know, there's an existing series that the company owns and then they put you on that series. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's like, well, play. So, sorry, I, if I can interrupt, I mean, um, I mean, certainly like Marvel owns Spider-Man and you're playing in Marvel sandbox, mm-hmm. but, but there's this added layer of like Hasbro, the toy company owns, uh, GI Joe. And, uh, like there are artists who, um, if they draw a comic based on like the Spider-Man TV cartoon, they'll never get hired to draw the regular Spider-Man book because they're, they're stereotyped as the artist who only draws in quote that animated style so <laughs> though there is plenty of work for writers in comics and novels on licensed stuff like you know angel buffy aliens um th- i guess that that was my question sort of less um any licensed characters as versus uh creator owned whereas the sort of three different categories of creator owned like 
company owned and then the comics companies licensing from third party studios and toy companies. Uh, I wasn't worried about it. Uh, okay. A lot of it comes down to the attitude of editors that you're talking to. Um, some editors will think it's cool, you know, like, oh yeah, I, I watched GI Joe growing up too. That's really cool. Uh, and then, I mean, there are, there are some that are, they, they get kind of snobby about it. Um, mm. I ran into a DC editor at, I think it was like wizard world Philadelphia one year and I hadn't seen him in a, in a little while. And, um, uh, uh, he said, oh, hey, Dan, uh, what you been up to? You keeping busy? And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I've been writing uh, uh, Voltron and Micronauts for, for Devil's Due, and I just did a, a four-issue G.I. Joe arc. And, <laughs> and he, his response was... <clears throat> oh, no. Hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and he ended the conversation really quickly. And I was like, oh, well, you know what? screw you sideways too pal <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but it didn't stop me from going on to get like mainstream stuff you know i, I did um dc tapped me to do the firestorm reboot in 2004 and uh at the same time i had a creator owned comic come out from dc called uh, bloodhound which which <laughs> very few people read <laughs> Uh, that's the one uh, a couple issues had DC characters and then when Dark Horse reprinted it those issues were not included uh, there was one issue where the where the main character of Bloodhound actually crossed over with Firestorm okay so it was the, the, the two that I was writing and so that one issue had to be excluded from the from the Dark Horse reprint um, the other issues that featured uh, a DC character, it was uh, not a very well-known character, and we were able to change the name and the lettering and make art adjustments and call him, <laughs> you know, call him a, a different, uh, make him a different character. Okay, and and f- with the Firestorm issue not in that book, someone reading it, it's not it's not going to read like there's a hole in it, right? No, no, that was I, I very deliberately wrote those the the two crossover issues to be like standalone okay outside of continuity okay uh alongside this you you then uh you're credited as co-writer on the gi joe versus transformers book with uh josh blaylock uh where i I think think for for the last two issues or so of of that that series can you tell us what uh you know what that co-writer kind of experience was was like we sort of speculated when we were talking about the issue whether it was you know a last minute come in and save you know josh is against the wall and just he's got the story ideas and and just can't get the script out or maybe it was a sort of side conversation in a convention and you contributed some ideas and it just got incorporated into the book or and to um, remind our listeners that's that's a six issue miniseries um as i recall it was uh like Josh, Josh's schedule was very, very, very full. And so, yeah, he was, he did the first four issues and then he said, Hey Dan, can you do the last two? Mm-hmm. So he just, he, there was an outline already and, uh, I just came in to do the, the, you know, to, to, to finish it out. But GI Joe versus the Transformers part two was entirely me. Mm-hmm. And that was one, we- Sorry. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, we haven't read that yet in our chronological we, um, reading for this podcast. Yeah. But please I, I did read ahead for this interview, just so <laughs> so it was fresh in my fresh in my mind. I did uh, not. I'm only asking about Icebound. <laughs> um, well, there's, there's a, a funny story to do with, uh, with G.I. Joe versus Transformers Part 2. <laughs> Which, that's something that, like, if you're talking to, like, Hollywood executives... Um, mentioning that you've worked on something like that, uh, that tends to come across as a little bit of a punchline, you know, because it sounds like such a um, uh, a manufactured product. You know, it, it sounds like something done to fulfill some sort of contractual obligation. <laughs> <laughs> G.I. Joe versus the Transformers Part 2! Um, but, I mean, I had a lot of fun with it, and Josh asked me for a pitch and I said, okay, how about this? Um, the GI Joe team has to go to, uh, Cybertron. Um, and 
because everything on Cybertron is is uh, you know robotic. There's nothing. There aren't any um, living beings there as we understand them, or at least not any intelligent ones. Uh, the the GI Joe team has to uh, abandon all of their equipment and go in with just like the clothes on their backs and infiltrate because none of the none of the sensors or surveillance systems would be calibrated to pick up organic life forms. So it would be like this uh, this infiltration story uh, with the with the Joes overcoming all of this potentially horrible. Um, terrifying Cybertronian stuff uh, using nothing but their wits, and uh, and I wanted to call it Blind Spot. And Blaylock said, mm, "Nah, <laughs> nah, it's, uh, it's kind of boring. What else you got?" And uh, I, it kind of harkened back to the uh, to to what I have been given to understand was the origin of the Dreadnoughts. When you know Larry Hama had them, had this uh, basically evil outlaw biker gang smoking cigars and drinking whiskey, and and Hasbro was like, "No, you can't, you can't show people smoking and drinking." And he was like, "But they're the bad guys." And Hasbro said, "Yeah, but it sets a bad example for the kids." And he was like, "But they're the bad guys." <laughs> and and Hasbro said, "No, you you can't do it." And 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 Hama was like, "Oh." Fine, fine, fine. They drink grape soda and eat jelly donuts. How about that? And Hasbro said, "Oh yeah, that's good." <laughs> um, so you know, it it I it irked me a little bit that the Josh really didn't like my pitch, and and I said, "Okay, fine, fine. How about um, there's a big battle, and um, Teletran 1 gets hit with a laser blast, and it, it malfunctions, and it starts zapping the Joes into different time periods. And Josh said, oh yeah, that's good, do that. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have, have to write this thing. So we have time travel. <laughs> But it but it was a lot of fun doing that. I got to put the put the different characters in you know some some cool situations, and uh, and I I honestly don't remember which one it was in. It was the first miniseries or the second, but at one point, Snake Eyes jumps onto Starscream's face and slices open his eyeball with his katana and shoves a grenade inside it and then backflips off him and Starscream, the, the grenade blows up and knocks him off a cliff. And I was like, that is exactly what I wanted to see in the cartoon growing up. <laughs> um, so as far as action choreography, that's a high point for me. Yeah, I think that was uh, might have been issue five or six of uh, the first uh, the first series. That okay. Snake Eyes All right. moment. Um, when, while I was setting up this uh, interview with Dan, I asked if he could come up uh, with some things for Devil's True or Devil's Poo. So some uh, facts and some uh, lies uh, to for us to judge whether they're uh, true or poo. Devil's true, true, true. A poo, poo, poo is all I want to know right now. So Dan, take it away. What have you got for us? Okay, all right. Let's let's count down. So number three. Um, Duke on the cover of part four of the Icebound miniseries uh, was modeled after Bruce Willis. Hmm. That sounds gonna, plausible. I'm going to say poo. And I know that Tony Harris uses a uh, photo reference and he, he uh, I think he casts like models uh, for his photo reference, but would probably also use like photos of actors or stills from movies. Uh, I'm going to say poo. And I, that, I, that I don't see Bruce Willis here in this drawing. I think uh, I think I'm going to go. Say, I think it's who i think possibly people have speculated that it was based on bruce willis but it's not are those your final answers yes lock it in ding okay yeah that's poo um that's a, that's actually tony harris's face <laughs> nice yeah tony uh turned himself blonde 
and uh, yeah, that's him. <laughs> nice. Uh, and th- that image, uh, um, uh, I don't know if uh, coincidentally or directly, but um, recalls uh, an interior panel from issue seven that's on page uh, five, drawn by uh, Feaster in the flashback, uh, where we see Duke holding a gun kind of similar to that. All right, uh, number two, I, please. I thought you were going to say something different because it put me in mind slightly of... Uh, I don't know what year this would have come out, but Wanted by uh, Mark Miller and is it J.G. Jones or not or something, where uh, his character was based on uh, Eminem. Uh, oh right. Yeah, so he's not looking like Eminem, but there was a there's he was uh, for a lot of the plot he was sort of in like a hoodie and uh, a beanie and sort of with rap style pointing guns down. I I, uh, I do think that J.G. Jones was using a lot of photo reference to make that character look like that real oh yeah for sure yeah i think mark miller i think as a gimmick said yeah Uh, right cast cast him as uh okay number two um this 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 will be this will be like a true or false um one of the four covers the uh devil's do demanded that it be heavily photoshopped before it was (laughs) before it was uh, before it was accepted Oh, that's intriguing. And then, and hmm. and then, and then, bonus bon, bonus points if you can guess which cover. I'm going to say true, and uh, issue seven with Scarlet, mm. and I'm going to take a an added leap and say that uh, either Hasbro had something to say about Scarlet's pose or costume, or Devils do preemptively had something changed or redrawn thinking that Hasbro might have a problem with Scarlet's pose or costume in number seven. Yeah. A hundred percent agree with Tim's speculation. I think that they, they must've thought that it would be too uh, suggestive a pose and uh, had to, had to be toned down, get rid of some of those uh, suggestive curves and lines. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. You guys are really good. Uh, that's that's exactly right. But it it wasn't so much that the pose was bad; it was that the uh, the the model was a good bit more, let's say, bootylicious than uh, <laughs> th- than mm. what made it onto the the final cover. And so, yes, mm. there there was significant booty reduction going on with the <laughs> with the cover there. Does does that original version still exist in any any form? Oh, I'm sure Tony has it somewhere. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> All right, Mark, start writing an email. Can, yeah, can you ask him to send it to us, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay, number three. And this this isn't about the story, it's about the publisher. Devil's Do's offices in Chicago were so fancy, they <laughs> had an entire conference table and chair set made completely of lucite. I have no idea what lucite um, even is. Oh, uh, lucite is a, a clear plastic. Uh, oh, lucite is uh, it's basically what uh, CGC comics are slabbed in. Wow. Or or it, it is what what CGC comics are slabbed in. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I have to think this through out loud. So uh, we're we're at like issue um, uh, sixteen in the regular run, and the first four issues of the regular run had been published by monthly. So we're effectively like. Uh, 20 months we're we're almost two years into the devil's due run and uh, they made they made a lot of money they sold a lot of comics those first couple of issues Um, but I'm trying to think back to our interview with Blaylock if he talked about them spending that money on improvements in the office so Dan I'd say that most of the money he went did go back into the company in various forms hmm but that but that might mean like uh, um expenses for travel to conventions and you know paying uh some some uh, expensive cover artists i'm gonna say poo it's weirdly specific um uh i'll go i'll go poo too uh you're both wrong devil's ah. new oh. totally had an entire conference table and chair set made completely of lucite Wow. Uh, which begs the question, um, how often did you go to the Devil's Due office in Chicago and why? I went there once. Uh, they uh, they flew me up there for a story conference. I don't remember which project it was for. 
Uh, but, uh, but yeah, they, they flew me up there for like uh, a couple of days and the, and then the rest of the offices were, were the rest of the office were, it was equally as fancy. It was a super, super nice environment. Wow. I, I guess I'm just remembering the early part of our interview when Blaylock was talking about their small, not fancy office <laughs> <laughs> Bef- before the money came in. Um, I, I appreciate, uh, that these are, these 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 three trivia questions feel not just like someone who was there, but like a writer <laughs> is is fashioning them for the, <laughs> and for the entertainment of our audience and to put Mark and I through um, some paces. <laughs> front line, front line, front line. They're stalking behind comic scenes, behind, behind the, the comic scenes. scenes. Mark, Mark J and, and Tim. It's the spin-off that has survived. There's no yawning to find the meaning. Is it good? Is it shite? G.I. Joe, Frontline on. Talking Joe. Well, G.I. Joe, Frontline on. Talking Joe. G.I. Joe, Frontline on. Talking Joe. Well, G.I. Joe, Frontline on. Talking Joe. Okay, so creative team for this book, uh, which was... Published uh, March 2003 to July 2003, so around about issues 15 to 19 of the regular series uh, during the Cabal arc. Uh, So story, Dan Jolly, Drew Johnson. Script, Dan Jolly. Pencils, Drew Johnson, Tom Feister and Javier Pina. Inks, Ray Snyder, Albert Zike, Cole. Colours, J.D. Mettler, Studio Din and Meter, Letters, Dan Jolly and Dreamer Design, Edit Scott Whirl and Graphic Design, Mike Norton. So we've talked about them a little bit. Uh, should we have a look at the covers? Yeah. Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. So all four covers here. Tony Harris, I'd uh, made a mental note here that uh, it's not the first time you'd worked with him before, that you'd done some larger projects like Doctor Strange, The Flight of Bones, and JSA, The Liberty File, by this point. But you've already explained that uh, you were in the same studio at this point. So the uh, my guess in in the in the research for this um, was right that that the sort of the connecting part uh was was your kind of history with um uh, tony mm-hmm. issues five and six are are if you squint more similar than dissimilar five is almost all blue a very green blue and six is a very blue green uh and if you squint seven and eight are more similar than dissimilar because uh, they both uh have a lot of um black at the top um harris is um, in in 2003, he's uh, an early artist who is um, penciling and inking and coloring his own work, right? There aren't a lot of people in comics who are doing that, or almost no one in mainstream comics who are doing that at that point. Oh, no, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't doing all of that. Uh, he was primarily a penciler. Uh, for the covers. Oh, oh, for the covers. No, uh, he didn't color the covers. That was... Um... Uh, J.D. Mettler, I believe, did, oh, did the colors on okay. those as well. If I'm if I'm recalling correctly. All right. Thank you for the thank you for the correction. All right. Okay. So th- right. What what I should say here is, uh, and this that, is that bef- makes sense because the so the the kind of effects that we're seeing with the snow on the, that first cover are kind of echoed in the the way that it appears in the interiors. I think in issue four when. Uh, that sort of that same scene is repeated on the interiors with the kind of that snowstorm and the, the the snow being kind of whipped up in the air by the the helicopter blades. Um, how I can correct that statement is to say that in 2003, uh, this is before the modern era of colorists signing their work on covers, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> before the interiors, uh, if they credited a cover artist, before they tended to also credit the cover colorist. Harris's work, he's, he has a real knack for drawing um, not just uh, good looking faces, but also particular faces. You know, his his people, he, he casts people when he draws them. So 
uh, you know, Duke on one cover is going to look like Duke on another cover. And it's not, it's not like, you know, the sort of uh, typical comic book thing where it's like everyone looks the same. You've just changed their wig or their like facial hair. <laughs> right. They're, you know, like a beefy man. Um, and we do see Duke on uh, three of these covers. Um, the cover to four, uh, five is a little unusual in that it it is the flashback that um, incites the whole um, modern part of this uh, story. Um, uh, issue eight, the cover is a little unusual in that it's quote letterboxed. Uh, there's there's a uh, it's more squarish, but it's basically a rectangular drawing that's horizontal with Duke pointing this pistol uh, just just past us and a, a black bar on the top and bottom. Um, you know, my personal preference is that uh, even if they're underwater or in the snow, you find a way to put G.I. Joe characters in their normal costumes rather than cover them in like big white Arctic coats where they end up all looking the same. Uh, and Snake Eyes and Scarlet on these covers do get their, quote, regular uh, G.I. Joe costumes. And Duke is definitely Arctic geared up here. So uh, if you showed me the cover to issue six and all I saw was this image... Uh, I know it's one of the blonde Joes with short hair, but I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, that's definitely Duke. Um, but um, uh, I like that there's a story that's told across these four covers, right? We start with the flashback, right? Duke on this earlier mission seven years ago uh, for five, the initial attack of the, the monster uh, for six. Um, in seven, you get this red light over Scarlet. Um, so things are getting... Uh, bad, although this cover also sort of takes a moment out to slow down and give us more of a glamour shot of a character, even though she's somewhat in action. Uh, and then um, issue eight, the cover somewhat reflects the emotional content of the interior where the stakes are getting high for Duke because he lost the first team to do this mission. He's not going to lose the second one, and he almost gives up at the end of the issue. Uh, and so on the cover, we see him with this steely resolve. Um, uh, the first cover, Duke has no weapon, just has a flare so he can be found. And uh, uh, on six and seven and eight, uh, well, Snake Eyes has a machine gun, but on the other three covers, it's just pistols. So the Joes here are, are outgunned because they did not go into this base uh, in the interior pages, uh, geared up with lots of machine guns. Mm. They just went in with sidearms. Dan, have you got um, a take on on these these covers, or any particular thoughts that are brought back when uh, when seeing them? I guess working in the same studio environment, I'd, I'd assume that this is a kind of a, a a more potentially a more collaborative effort on the covers between you as the writer and and the cover artist, rather um, you know, as opposed to a normal kind of editorial filter. Um. Well, uh, for the covers there, Tony really, really wanted to establish himself as a cover artist. Um, you know, the uh, cover artists can command a really, really nice page rate. You know, the sought-after cover artists get paid a lot. And, and he wanted to, to become a sought-after cover artist. Uh, and uh, for this series, uh, he, he basically just said, you know what, I'm going to do the covers that I want to do. <laughs> and, and you know i had no reason to think that that would be a bad decision uh huh. and you know it, it and it wasn't it's not like i had any kind of veto power you're right it was a collaborative situation but tony said i want to do the covers that i want to do and i said so um uh i didn't as the writer i didn't have much input on those covers tony just did them and and i said okay yep that's the that's the covers so <laughs> let's let's turn them in now the covers had to be done earlier than the pages because the covers have to be, have to be put in catalogs for stores to order, right? Yeah, that happens pretty often. I don't think it was the case in this instance because um, I write scripts really, really, really fast. I mean, not the fastest, but I'm pretty fast. So I already had the story mapped out um, mm. and like broken down by issue by the time we were really getting started with all of this and so tony knew what was happening in each issue okay so let's get into the plot breakdown back in 1995 after gi joe had disbanded 
At a Norwegian Arctic research base, scientists working on a top-secret project named Operation Coldfire were testing a process to create a soldier more resistant to extreme temperatures. The genetic material mutated and infected some of the lab technicians. After the station went offline, Duke led a team of army rangers to investigate. That mission failed and Duke was the sole survivor. Years later, a distress signal is received from the Operation Coldfire site. A team is formed with Duke, Scarlet, Snake Eyes, Lifeline, Frostbite and Airtight to investigate. After arriving on site, the Joe team searches the abandoned laboratory and discover frozen bodies, secret rooms and documents. The body is defrost as power is restored to the complex. Mysterious monster creatures attack and Lifeline is slashed by one of the creatures. There is concern that he could be infected. Lifeline theorises that the monsters are a result of crossing human DNA with polar bears. The G.I. Joe team search the caves under the laboratory for a life form they have detected and find a civilian, the person that had sent the distress signal. The Joes are attacked by the creatures but have some success in fending them off. A way out of the laboratory is figured out. The Joe team trick the creatures into areas where they're trapped and are able to disable the electric lock on the exit doors, allowing the entire team to escape from the laboratory. Duke will contact Wild Bill to nuke the entire site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Oops, I oh know, I read that wrong. I meant to <laughs> arrange a containment team along to deal with the remaining mess. I did think, I did think as I started to read that uh, bit of dialogue, I thought, are they going to blow this place up? <laughs> and finally, great news. Lifeline is not infected. He's going to be A-OK. Yo, Joe. So I want to get to this overall question that I have. I thought of this both recently, getting ready to read these issues for this episode, for this interview. But I also thought this at the time um, when I read these issues, because the, the plot or the story concept of a team or a lone individual stuck in the Arctic or Antarctic, a bottle story, right? Like stuck in a base against some kind of monster brings to mind uh, both John Carpenter's The Thing and also the X-Files episode Ice, which I think is season one, might be season two. And I had seen both of these relatively recently before this arc came out. So when this arc came out, I thought, oh, it's like it's like G.I. Joe doing that story. Uh, and I know that art, uh, writers sort of taking that kind of sentence. It's like, oh, I'm going to do my Spider-Man, like the most dangerous game story, or like, I'm going to do my Daredevil, but like Frankenstein's monster story, right? Like taking the, the, the character or team that we're following and somewhat grafting it onto an established historical uh, story type. So my question, Dan, is were those two stories or other, that movie, that episode, or other ones like them, on your mind when you came up with this or is that coincidental uh no that's not coincidental at all <laughs> it was you've hit the nail on the head okay um, yes, i'm gonna do i'm gonna do gi joe in john carpenter's the thing um more or less yeah yeah um you know <clears throat> these arcs needed to be self-contained and uh they they weren't supposed to like mess with canon and so you know i thought well what I what I need to do is some kind of haunted house story, and uh, I was a huge X Files fan, loved the episode Ice, loved John Carpenter's The Thing, and uh, at the time, uh, I had been introduced to the book The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler, and in that book, Vogler lays out it's based on the work of Joseph Campbell. It's a uh, a 12-part structure for stories. Vogler never says, you must tell stories according to this structure. He just says, this is a structure that shows up in tons and tons and tons of stories across every culture and has from the beginning of time. And you may find this useful. So uh, that was the first time that I had really deliberately followed this particular structure so so the whole thing was kind of an experiment honestly uh to me like as a writer taking this approach with from from the craft side of it 
Can I tell a, a story that, that I would enjoy based on things, taking, taking very direct inspiration from things that I enjoy using this structure that uh, is very tried and true? And um, so, yeah, it, it turned out that, that it, it seems to work. I should add that in the letters pages for these four issues, mm. uh, someone points out that this feels like John Carpenter's The Thing, and someone points out that this feels like the X-Files episode, uh, Ice. So there's, um, there's a rather cutting comment in the letters pages. It says, it sort of calls out these these things and, and sort of describes them as being sampled. And he says, I'm, I'm left feeling a little like a, t- t- a teacher grading an excellent paper, but he knows that the student didn't write. <laughs> Regardless, I'm a big fan and will continue to buy the books. Uh, so I, I, uh, I'm not going to defend our guest just because our guest is our guest, but uh, uh, I, I do think that the amount of borrowing from those previously established stories that happens in this story is allowed and that I would not use that analogy if I read this comic <laughs> that I'm grading a paper that the student didn't entirely write because there are there are enough specifics in this story that make this its own story and there are certainly enough changes. Well, and you know, it's co- commonly said that there are no original stories. The the only way to be original is in how you tell the story. Mm-hmm. And you know, this is like when Die Hard came out. And then you had uh, a, under siege, a, a, under siege, and it was it was <laughs> literally marketed. This is Die Hard on a train, and then you had um, something else that was Die Hard on a boat, and then I think eventually it was like Die Hard at a hockey rink, and uh, <laughs> you know I think that was the the Jean Claude Van Damme entry in the so so yeah, it, it was it was basically me trying to figure out do I need to be 100% original all the time or can I pay homage to things? So, you know, I'll, I'll take that on the chin. Yes, this was, this was me doing John Carpenter's the thing in the GI Joe universe. And I, you know, I'll, I'll own it. If you, if you, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to uh, spank me for it, then, you know, go ahead. But that's, that's, that's fine. Also, uh, there isn't one monster in this G.I. Joe story. There are several. And in that regard, this feels less like borrowing from the thing. I haven't seen the thing in a while, but there's just one of them, right? Yes. Um, it, the movie's not called The Things, right? <laughs> but also the, the fact that there are uh, several monsters in the story um, does make it feel more like, as G.I. Joe stories go, episodes of the cartoon mm. than issues of the comic and dan we've talked about on this show uh how uh when josh blaylock starts writing and publishing gi joe gi joe subtly and overtly feels like it's now a mix of the marvel larry hama series and also the animated series Mm -hmm. as opposed to just a continuation of the marvel series yeah that that was one of my main observations about big picture of, of this this arc is that you know the enemy in here are these these monsters and it's it's unlike what would be in it's, it's unlike kind of the threat that would be in the typical larry hammer written comic and and sort of closer to the kind of threat that you'd see in in the cartoon um well i i'm a huge science fiction fan and uh, I, I will readily admit that I'm a bigger fan of science fiction than necessarily of like military adventure. So I think you, I, you know, you're what you're saying is is dead on. You know, if if someone wants to make the observation that this feels more like the cartoon, I mean, I you know, I watched a lot more of the cartoon than I read of the comics. So <laughs> you know, guilty as charged. Did you pick this team? Yeah. The, yes. the characters. Okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, it seemed like the most logical group to send, you know, the hazardous environment expert and the medic, and then, like, uh, the, the way I saw it, probably the, the two Joes the Duke would trust the most, uh, mm. Scarlet and Snake Eyes. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in, the, in the script specifically, it, it calls out that this team was picked for a reason and call, calling out the skills Home combat, hazardous material handling, Arctic conditions, and 
and medical and and what i was going to say is probably one of the things that i like most about this particular arc is that smaller specialized team with the specializations being there for a reason it's not just a arbitrary collection of of joes and having that smaller team allowed for more character characterization you know between the characters and it, they're not just sort of interchangeable joes again that sort of, you're establishing yeah air tight was... as a jokester frostbite <laughs> telling de- depressing stories and <laughs> so on yeah that story that he tells about the rabid dog uh yeah. that that like actually happened to my uncle <laughs> <laughs> being chased around the house um yeah so um i forget which character it is who responds well you tell the best stories <laughs> yeah um, i think that's air tight but uh, <laughs> for for like a couple of months after that, Tom Feaster would would say that to me, you know, if I, <laughs> if, I if I said something that he found either funny or depressing or dumb or whatever, he just very sar- sarcastically, "You tell the best stories, Dan." <laughs> yeah, he says, and, and then later on in the, it, he says something like, uh, "I'm not going to get the na- right name, but he says something like." Your your code name shouldn't be Frostbite. It should be Bad Storyo. Or something like that. <laughs> I don't remember that part. But <laughs> but but as far as picking the specialized teams, what I was thinking about there was uh, Mission Impossible, like the the uh-huh. the original TV show, which I watched, you know, in in reruns, of course, but as a, a little kid. And uh, every episode, Jim Phelps would get the briefing, and then he'd he'd like page through his portfolio of agents and pick the ones that were specialized for this purpose. So you know the, the cast, it would be a rotating cast. Um, I always really liked the ones that had Leonard Nimoy on them. <laughs> I I have often thought that um, one of the I love the GI Joe cartoon, but sort of a mistake that it made is that it sort of presented the the Joes as the stand-in for the armed forces mm. rather than rather than a like special forces team mm-hmm. and you you wouldn't get these stories where like 30 joes like drive across a field with tanks shooting at cobra you you'd only have mission impossible stuff where it's like okay i need this person and this person for this mission and then we're not going to see them again for several episodes or or issues something that something that struck me sort of as a, a storytelling conceit Early on in this this issue, we sort of introduced to um, the EMP pen uh, casually by uh, mainframe to, to Duke, um, you know, something that he had picked up. Can you take this along to you know, secure storage? And uh, and I thought, aha, I know for sure this is going to play a key plot moment uh, later on in in this in the story. And I had to I looked looked up to remind myself of the the, the storytelling device name, um, uh, Chekhov's gun. <laughs> Chekhov's Chekhov's EMP. Yeah, it's a dr- dramatic principle that states that for uh, every element of a story must be necessary and irrelevant uh, elements should be removed. Elements should not uh, appear to make false promises by never coming into play. Uh and uh, this yeah, state this statement recorded in letters by Anton Chekhov. Uh, remove everything it's no relevance to the story if you say in the first chapter that there is an emp handed to duke then in the last chapter it absolutely must be used or it shouldn't be there um i think that's what he wrote in his letters at the time <laughs> uh, when you read stories by people who are still learning to write or you watch films by people who are still learning how to make film you will sometimes experience a story where all of a sudden in the third act, even if this is a five minute film, someone like pulls out a gun and you're like, whoa, 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 there are guns in this story. It's like you need to introduce that that EMP pen at the beginning of your story in order to defeat the monster and get out of the Arctic base uh, at the end of the story. Also, um, Mark, Dan has two Chekhov's uh, pens in the story because the centrifuge. Uh, the page before the pen, oh. Duke happens to go through the gym and Jinx says, oh, I want to show this move to all these, I guess, green shirts in like white uh, martial arts outfits. And uh, the two of them do this flip. And I think he does that flip on one of the monsters at the end of the final uh-huh. chapter to to get out of uh, he's he's being held. He's being pinned down or he's I don't know why I've got it in front of me. I can just flip to that page. Um, but uh 
Yeah. Her, break your <laughs> neck first, then bite off your head. And then Duke uh, has his foot up on the wall and flips over, and the monster goes, Her, uh, So it's not exactly that, but I, I think, uh, you know, let me ask the guy who who, uh, who wrote this scene. Dan, is this, is this Duke doing the jinx flip from the first chapter again to get I, out of the monster's script? I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. I, I don't remember that specifically, um, but the, the, the EMP pin... Uh, I know I got dinged in the letters column for for that for like oh wow what an obvious plant <laughs> um, and and you know I mentioned that I was like deliberately following the the Vogler twelve step story structure to to just to see if it would work and one of those steps is called meeting with the mentor and a thing that often happens when you're meeting with the mentor is that they give you a gift. And uh, for a very famous example, when Luke Skywalker meets with Obi Wan Kenobi for the first time, I think you're going too obscure. I don't. I'm not familiar with this story. <laughs> <laughs> Obi Wan Obi Wan gives him his father's lightsaber. Yeah, you know that's the gift. And so you mm. know, mainframe is the, standing in for the mentor here. And and yes, that EMP pen was the gift that the hero gets. And um, you know it. Uh, uh, the the guy in the letter column was like, "Way to telegraph, Jolly." Um, <laughs> you'll be you'll be pleased to know, uh, as attentive as I am as I read this, because I was taking notes and I, I read comics sort of close up and frowning, like looking for <laughs> things uh, to um, complain about. Um, uh, when when Mainframe hands him this pen, I I vaguely thought. Oh, is that something from the concurrent arc in the main Blaylock book? Because this seems to sort of jump out. Yeah, that must be something. That must be one of those like one page subplots uh, that Blaylock was doing in the main book to set up his next arc. And yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. And so so it, it actually it should have jumped out at me as uh, as um, as uh, Obi-Wan's uh, giving this lightsaber as uh, as quite apparent. Um, but I sort of let it um, wash over me as a uh, as a more subtle Chekhov's gun. There's there was also there was a, a later one which is is less you know tele- telegraphed and also you know resolves itself in a much shorter space of time, which which I alluded to was uh, where Duke picks up a centrifuge and whacks one of the the monsters with that, and and I thought to myself, huh, that's weirdly specific thing to be hitting him with that's yeah that's that's interesting and then that plays out a a, f- a few pages later that the, at that point in time duke must have also found the you know the chit of paper or, or, or noticed the result on it that that said uh that the test was all clear you know what i appreciate you calling so that's on the same that's just one panel after uh duke flips over the the monster and gets out of its grip um, and when I read that, I, I couldn't quite tell what it was. I thought, is this a little radio? But now that you are reminding me, Mark, that it is the centrifuge from the previous issue uh, where Lifeline is running. Oh, from, from earlier on in that issue where Lifeline's running a test. Uh, anyway, um, Dan, what is, your, um, what is your sense as writing this story? What is your responsibility? How much real estate can you give to the flashback where you're building up the, um, the Duke's uh, failure in this earlier mission so that he can feel sad or guilty or resolved in the present day? The, the guys on the mission, they get named and we, we sort of see them in action in like th- three scenes. Um, but they're not Joes. They're just like other generic you know, Rangers or Green Berets or something. And they need to all not to make it out. So you don't have a lot of time to make us care about them. Can you talk about striking that balance? Honestly, a lot of that was purely logistical because uh, Tom Feaster was the one who wanted to do the, the pencils for the flashbacks. And uh, he had not been in the comics industry for very long he uh was an animator he was working for cartoon network 
Uh, I think he was one of the animators on Powerpuff Girls, actually. And uh, he he got into comics and joined the studio and, uh, you know, was eager for exposure, but he also didn't want to overextend himself. So um, the length of the flashback sequence was really based on him telling us how many pages he felt like he could do within the deadline. <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. What what I really what I really appreciated about the flashback sequence was the fact that it was all coloured blue, and it was instantly obvious that it was the <laughs> flashback sequence, and there wasn't any of that mentally juggling of okay, are we back in the present? Are we? Is this the flashback again? Which um, shouldn't be a hard storytelling telling feat, but often does kind of introduce un, you know unintended you know confusion, but um, very clear. Yeah. yeah, I think people who make comics are sometimes uh, worried that they're um, taking some kind of shortcut or sort of um, in terms of the value of buying the comic and the reading experience, shortchanging the reader if they uh, don't take the hard way out. You know, I mean, you know, like the, there's that issue of, uh, of Alpha Flight that John Byrne wrote and drew in like 1986, which like is entirely in a snowstorm. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. And he gets and it's all just blind. like it's it's all like word balloons. And so there are all these panels with sort of no drawing. Um, and similarly, uh, uh, I worked on a, a TV show um, when I got out of college, an animated show. And there was an episode where uh, the characters are camp. I didn't do this scene. The characters are camping. And I think they, they like don't their flashlight goes out or like the campfire goes out, and so there's a lot of flickering. And uh, the animator across the room said, "I'm just gonna have like two thirds of every shot just cut to black, and all we're gonna see are the whites of their eyes. So I don't have to animate their mouths. I don't have to animate <laughs> lip sync. I can finish this scene like two days earlier because we were like having deadline trouble. And like when you watch when you watch that episode, it doesn't call itself out as." A lazy shortcut it calls itself at as unusual or maybe even clever so um, I feel like someone might look at a comic right a colorist who wants to color um, uh, using a, a, a large palette lots of rendering lots of effects um, or a reader who has come to expect um, a lot of intense coloring in modern comics uh, that you approach these flashback scenes and you're like how can I make this harder yeah. Right. Like how for myself to do better work or for the reader who like needs more out of this. But sometimes it's like, no, this is just all light blue with white highlights. And as Mark says, it is instantly apparent what this is. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not just about clarity, but it's also about the effect um, that, uh, you know, through the you know, it's not through the haze of Duke's memory seven years ago. It's as bright as clear as day. He remembers it like it's yesterday. Um, so I also appreciate that that color approach. I think that was something that uh, Tom and uh, J.D. Mettler worked out between them. Just, you know, like I one of the things that uh, has been most valuable as a comic book writer is knowing when to get out of the way of the artists. Um, you know, I might have some specific ideas, but uh, as far as presenting things visually telling the story visually um designing characters and such there's a really really good chance that the artist is going to have better ideas about that than i will and uh you know i'm not gonna stand in their way can you um all right so the final chapter um it is pen the entire final chapter part four is penciled by someone else inked by someone else colored by someone else and uh, I I am aware of, uh, I mean, ever since like the Filipino invasion uh, at DC in the 70s, where DC hired a bunch of artists from the Philippines who were very good, um, there has been uh, there has been a trend in comics, right, and it continues to this day, where editors will find artists who are overseas who are very good. Uh, and who often work cheaper than American artists. Um, but just looking at these names, and, you know, like Javier Pina draws comics, you know, it's like doing stuff for DC these days, uh, this inker and these two colorists or studios I don't recognize. But 
I, I wonder, do you know anything about Devil? I'll just, I'll phrase it a question. Do you know anything about, specifically about Devil's Do? Um, the entire fourth chapter of the story is drawn, colored, drawn, inked, and colored by uh, not just different people than like Devil's Do was using at the time, but people who I like haven't, weren't, weren't seeing in comics in 2003. Um, the creative team changed. Uh, there were deadline issues <laughs> and uh in order to meet the deadline devils do uh said you know what we're we're going to we're going to make this project meet the deadline and this is how we're going to do it i don't know how they chose the the artists for the final issue we didn't have any input on that i'm i'm, I'm trying to be as diplomatic about all this stuff as i can <laughs> It sounds like possibly there might have been a preference for for you to have tried to complete it uh, with with the original team, if at all possible. That would have been that would have been the preference, yes. Mm. <laughs> did um did uh, Jolly Roger being unable uh, in a in with the deadline to to to, the, to do the fourth chapter? Did this affect the ability to sell yourselves as this like packaging studio, or is it more like general than that? Um, it, uh, didn't do us any favors in that regard as far as working with Devil's Do. Hmm. Let's see, when was it? I think it's very near there. I think we were, uh, doing another JSA. We, because we did JSA The Liberty File, which was an Elseworlds project. And I think that was in, I want to say 2000 or 2001. And then we did a follow-up called The Unholy Three, uh, which was, I think, in 2003, if I'm recalling correctly. And uh, that one was very well... I mean, they were both well-received, but uh, The Unholy Three was actually nominated for an Eisner Award. Um, So, um, you know, that was was all for DC, and and, um, that project came together really well. Just there there were... There were deadline issues with G.I. Joe... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so sometimes art is, uh, you know, the creative endeavors are hard to um, wrangle. Mm. Right. Um, I'm looking. I'm looking here. Uh, it looks like Javier Pina, professionally uh, before GI Joe Frontline issue eight, uh, drew for three issues of Vampirella uh, for Harris. But that uh, that this this issue of GI Joe is very near the beginning of his. Uh, American professional career. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily think it to, to look at it that this was someone uh, only just starting out. You know, uh, yes, well I, I should. Thank you. Let me let me phrase it the other way. Uh, the uh, Dan, you may be pleased to know that though your team didn't finish this uh, arc, uh, the arc looks good in its final chapter. It's the not. Coloring... It's not overly jarring, and I think they've. They've clearly followed a lot of the cues established in the previous issues, particularly around kind of the the type of colours that are being employed with the the reds and you know in in the base and the blues on the on the flashback. I think that you know, that that sort of clearly established palette helps carry it through. Yeah, um, yeah, I was very pleased with the work that the new team did. There was uh, there's a moment that I thought I just call out which um i don't know if it was like a, an in, intentional kind of joke but it, it sort of it, it made me um chuckle to, to myself which was just uh, there's a moment where um duke is sort of wrangling uh with one of the uh polar bear uh uh monsters and uh and a grenade comes loose and then then they sort of he's like uh he says yow everybody move go 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 fire in the hole and behind him boom and it just made me made me think that with um the design of these G.I. Joe characters so many of them have got you know their accessories strapped to them and, and a lot of them got these grenades strapped on onto onto their chest it's it's almost uh a um you know it's a surprise that these kind of things don't happen more, <laughs> more <laughs> frequently that a grenade is not loose and uh, leading to un- unintended ex- explosions I I found that scene uh I found that moment um unconvincing <laughs> and uh if it was 
if Duke sort of had already grabbed a grenade and was starting to pull the pin and then the monster sort of just accelerated it with the way that it like swiped, uh, that's not in the art. If it really is just like the monster's claw like happens to grab the, the hoop of the pin and the swoop of his arm pulls it out, um, I thought that was uh, too convenient because uh, those those pins aren't easy to pull out, and I feel like um, so uh, so at the risk of at the risk of critiquing the story uh, to the person who wrote it, uh, Dan, I don't love that moment. In the story. Um, in, it, didn't, in, it didn't work for me. Uh, I, I can't really say that this is in my defense because I did write it, but I don't remember that moment. <laughs> <laughs> but but I will t- I will relate w- another moment that that uh, as I was writing it, I thought this is. This is, from a physics standpoint, kind of laughable, but um, but it felt right. It was uh, the, these these monsters, if I recall correctly, had been um, largely unaffected by gunfire, like the yeah. the the hand yeah. handgun, like the small caliber bullets didn't do much to them, and then Duke kicks one of them in the head, and that has an effect. <laughs> And um, at the time, I was like, oh, there's no way that a kick is going to do more damage than a bullet. But this is also this is also after uh, Lifeline says, uh, geez, my gun isn't doing much. I'll just I'll just run and push this thing and <laughs> shove it. And that's I think that's think, I think that's the first hint that he may be coming. He may be becoming a werewolf hmm. and he's got this sort of latent super strength. <laughs> Uh, which ends up not being the case, and so I retroactively think, oh, I guess that's just an adrenaline rush. Uh, but I think there, I think that is a similar second or, or earlier first case of the, uh, the 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 punching, kicking being stronger than the shooting. I, yeah. I thought that was potentially a, a deep cut there because um, Larry Hammer established that um, uh, in in special missions that Lifeline has got some martial arts background, which he doesn't necessarily like to employ very much and generally only in self-defense but here's a yeah here's a mutant um polar bear yeah. attacking him you know just this once he'll let loose one of those uh kicks well it put it, what i was thinking about was uh the final scene in jaws when uh <laughs> the uh the shark has the oxygen tank lodged in its in its mouth and the sheriff shoots it and it and it blows up. That's not how oxygen tanks work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that would put a hole in the oxygen tank and then the oxygen tank would leak and while it was leaking, the shark would come and eat the sheriff. <laughs> and, um, but, no, you spoiled uh, drawers. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's, what, is, what is that movie, 40 years old now? <laughs> Um, but no, I don't time, mean spoil the ending. I mean just spoil the. the, <laughs> the end. Now I well, look at it but, and like that wouldn't happen. But 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 at the time, like Spielberg um, acknowledged that that's not how oxygen tanks work. Oh, but no. but but he said, um, "I've got the audience. They're on my side with this. They're going to come along with me for the ride. And and when the shark blows up, it's everyone's going to love it." And, you know, of course, it blew up in the theater and the audiences were like, you know, cheering and standing and standing ovation and whatnot. Not trying to say that Duke kicking a mutant polar bear is like Jaws, <laughs> but it, it felt right to me at the time. And I, and I loved the idea of Duke kicking one of these things in the head. Um, and so that's 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 what happened. Here come the nit picker, Timmy Finn, and a little cool prankster, Timmy Finn, picking holes in your coloring, Timmy Finn, still love you, Joe, Timmy Finn. No, no, he won't lie. Yes, he testified. Anyone can see there's some criticism. 
Anything that he don't know Ain't a thing that's worth to know Pull him back and let him go Criticism Here come the nitpicker Timmy Finn Analytical prankster Timmy Finn Picking holes in your colouring Timmy Finn Still not up your joke Timmy Finn Um, well, um, I, while we're on the topic of, uh, of uh, things that work and things that don't quite work, um, I'll, oh dear, Tim. I'll, I'll, I'll rattle off a few. These, these are pretty mild. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be respectful, Mark. <laughs> um, so Mark, Mark refers to a line at, near the beginning of the first chapter, uh, which is uh, Duke saying, "I don't think a better team for this mission exists," and I think. I think spelling that out for the reader can be fun. I also and 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 maybe uh, it, with Dan's first GI Joe story, it feels like it needs to be stated aloud. But I feel like Duke knows these Joes, and they all know that they're the best of the best, and that they have specialties. And I feel like anytime a Joe picks other Joes for a specific mission, this idea is already embedded, and it doesn't need to be said aloud. It's like you six are just who I need for this mission. Um, I read that and I thought, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's this mission. Um, um, I don't, I don't, I didn't initially connect with uh, in the first chapter that the in the flashback the other soldiers on Duke's team that they don't make it out. I sort of shrugged my shoulders, uh, but as we see another flashback of them, uh, uh, I start to care about them. And then in the third chapter, where one of them says to Duke. Um, I need you to shoot me. I don't want that monster to get me. I, I thought, oh, that's great. Um, so it, it took a little while, but uh, Dan brought me along for the emotional ride uh, of feeling um, bad for uh, the, 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 the sacrificial lambs uh, in the flashback. And um, some, something that threw me a little bit in the, in the understanding of the story, and may, maybe, Dan, this, is, this has been something that you'll recall or have thought about in the interim, that gap between Duke's original mission and then coming back, um, it, it seems like there hasn't been a huge amount that's happened to this base since, despite these these monsters and stuff being being there. Why why do you think that would be that that another team hasn't been back in the in the interim to kind of figure out what had happened? Um, the only thing I recall is that Duke believed that it had been sealed just like been rendered unex- inaccessible mm-hmm. um so... i think the starfleet science corps of engineers went in <laughs> and sealed it i'm sorry please continue <laughs> they would have been the ones digging it out <laughs> um, <laughs> right so why it hasn't been explored since then i i don't know <laughs> fair enough <laughs> i i don't know you know this is th- this was a long time ago <laughs> And I don't recall all my mental processes at the time, you know. Yes, yeah, c- certainly that's the the reason given in in the story is that Duke thought it was sealed shut, and that was the end of it. Uh, it it might have been that it was considered hazardous enough to to treat like um, you know, like like Chernobyl. Let's let's bury mm-hmm. it under under millions of tons of concrete and pretend it's not there anymore. That's. Yeah. You know, I, I could see that being the reasoning taken by some branches of the military. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's inconvenient, and uh, let's bury it in paperwork, <laughs> even if <laughs> it's still there. Um, and, and you know, a case could be made just as well that this is a, a, a situation that needs to be completely understood, and let's send in some people to make sure that it doesn't happen again, or, or, or you know, whatever you want to do. Um, but that's that's what happened in this story. Um, I you know, I, all, all all these criticisms. I'm basically like, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's here's a here's a thing that works for me and a thing that uh, that doesn't. Um, Scarlet gets to be the one who shoots the Chekhov's gun uh, pen into the the door control panel. And as good as Scarlet is with her crossbow, and as often as we see her use it, um, I feel like we don't actually often see her use it to make the high stakes must get bullseye shot. 
And so I and, and we get three panels of this. She's hanging down from the ceiling. We get a close up of the 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 arrow, the crossbow bolt being fired, and then of it hitting. So as a little bit of business, uh, you know, because they're all good shots, but she's the expert with the crossbow crossbow bolt. Um, about four pages later, after Duke defeats the final uh, polar bear monster, and he trudges out of one room into another where there's still the red lighting. And there's all this, I think it's steam. It might be smoke. I'm not sure. Um, and then he's, he's crying and he f- collapses to his knees. And if it's like a chemical irritant or like smoke, I think he's, he's tearing up because his eyes hurt. If he's tearing up because he's sad that he's not going to make it out or that uh, they're all going to die. As a visual, I understand that that's what, that's what might want to happen. But my, my strong feeling about G.I. Joe characters is that these are, uh, these are tough military folks and they don't cry. Uh, and and I, have, I have been uh, tough on uh, Josh Blaylock's writing in his two-year run on G.I. Joe, where he often, de- he a few times depicts um, some of the female characters as sort of more emotional than the male characters, mm. which makes me uncomfortable and doesn't doesn't feel accurate. So I, I don't I don't love seeing Duke sort of giving up here and tearing up, but it does create some drama for the next page uh, that there's a bigger contrast there. If you like emotion, um, he can be crying because he's emotional, and if you don't like that, it's a chemical irritant. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I mean, I think this is the first time Duke has ever cried in a G.I. Joe comic. And so my question is, wh- why would he start now? It's like, oh, he's, he's been on tougher missions than this, right? My, uh, I think my final comment is one that is completely out of uh, Dan and the artist's control. And uh, that is that uh, when Frostbite is first made into an action figure, he has a beard. And when he secondarily gets an action figure, he has a beard. And then... When he gets a new action figure in like 2003, he doesn't have a beard. So when he shows up in this story, he doesn't have a beard. And to me, it was like Hasbro just wanted to make another Blizzard action figure. And they like either didn't have that name or they forgot and just called it Frostbite instead. So I had this, I had this tiny cognitive dissonance as I'm reading the story where it's like, shouldn't this guy have a beard? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, anybody who's going to spend the majority of their time in uh, extremely cold environments, uh, if if you can have a beard, then you should. Um, uh, yes, thank you. You're talking about it from a, a logical standpoint. I'm talking about it from a character design standpoint, that there are like small iconic cues. But it's like Duke's always going to have blonde hair and he's never going to have a goatee, right? But like maybe some of the Joes who had like full beards can go down to a goatee but i don't think a joe who has a beard should lose the beard well, mm. i'm pretty sure i'm recalling this correctly i'm pretty sure hasbro uh had specific character models mm. that we were required to use uh like details that had to be there and um i i think this is correct i think at the time hasbro said no beard so this uh, yes, is, this this is the frostbite action figure from like 2002 or 2003. Yeah. That that is, and also uh, the I, the snowcat from 2003. It, it has yeah with the extra looks different. It's got on an top. extra missile on on. It's got an extra missile sitting on top of the missile rack, <laughs> which is wonderful. <laughs> um, um, and Dan, and, and you... just to note that yeah, I think Josh Josh Blaylock um, and his art crew had included this specific version of Frostbite as the principal snow character in in his previous art, where where it been used it, about, around about issue three or four, I think it mm. was. Um, right. So so he... it's not it's not necessarily surprised that uh, you know possibly possibly there's a sort of encouragement to use this version of frostbite as the snow character given what was happening with the toys at the time dan i have i have one last um sort of writing question uh the joes find this uh this british guy uh this uh, mountain climber who has lost his team in this ice cavern and duke is gonna like save him does this guy come from the 12 step uh what's the name of the book that you would read oh the writer's journey 
Yeah. Is he, does he correspond? I do not recall the British guy in the ice cavern at all. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> This that's that's okay. Some, that, some, that makes the answer very fast. Some parts of this story stand out in my mind with crystal clarity, and and other parts have have just faded away. Well, when I got to the when I got to the British guy, I thought, "Ooh, a curveball!" I didn't think, "Dan Jolly, what are you doing?" <laughs> so, so that question was not from a place of uh, of dissatisfaction. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I guess it, it's a partly a storytelling MacGuffin as well because they've been the reason they're at this base is because there's been a distress call. So the and the reason behind this distress call is this British guy in the ice cave with a distinctive name, um, which I've forgotten. Um, wasn't that distinctive then? Uh, <laughs> tr- Chuck Trellis. He's Chuck called. Trellis. Oh, you know, I recycled that name. Um, one of one of the first novels that I wrote, there was uh, uh, a fan club started up for the main character after, after the protagonist got famous, and I, I said that it was run by a, by a kid in Tennessee named Chuck Trellis. <laughs> and uh, a friend of mine was was being a beta reader for the novel, and he was like, "This is too specific, Dan. This character uh, uh, is mentioned once and then never again. You don't need to use the name." But I liked the name, and so that I put it into into GI Joe. And now that I think about it, even though I still don't remember this character, it was probably because there is a section in the structure called Tests, Allies, and Enemies. And he might have been put in there to be an ally that the that mm. the hero meets on the journey. He, I guess he's he's the princess Leia in the in the cell block that gets rescued oh. before they go down the garbage chute, right? Um, <laughs> sure. I, I think he might. I think he might be Wedge <laughs> at, at the end. Should we look on? Uh, should we look onto some eye spying? Yeah, I spy, I spy with, with my little eye. eye. So, so this is the segment where we just point out some of the little nuggets of, of detail that, uh, that could quite easily be missed uh, as, as you're reading along. Uh, so uh, early on in the story, Duke jogs into the uh, Alvin R. Kibbe Memorial Gymnasium, which is named after Breaker, who was killed in action. They put made made a gymnasium in memory of their fallen comrade. I spy on page one of this entire arc, <laughs> panel one. Oh. It's not it's not quite a sky striker, which is a modified F fourteen. Uh, Drew Johnson is it, it, very it's clear. Yeah, Drew Johnson is very clearly drawing here from reference either. Uh, the 1985 uh, Autobot Jetfire or the Macross Valkyrie plane toy, which which the Jetfire toy is a like license of. Uh, and you can see the, these two small uh, sort of horizontal diagonal air intakes uh, at the base of the cockpit, um, as well as uh, like two or four like tabs sticking forward. And even down to the black marking, on the on the nose cone uh, of the of the plane, both in panel one and panel two, that that black marking sort of matches where the red marking is on this uh, Transformers toy. So uh, either a cute Easter egg. Let, let's do it the opposite angle. Either uh, Mr. Johnson uh, grabbed the wrong thing, or a cute Easter egg. I'm trying to remember. I think I think he had the Jetfire figures <laughs> sitting on his desk. There you go. Uh, I th- I, I want to say I, I can uh, I don't know I could call him up. <laughs> uh, he probably wouldn't remember either. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, he's you like know, remember that one panel film. you drew twenty <laughs> years ago. Hmm. Um, I have another I spy uh, mark unless you have one. Uh, I've got. I noticed that Airtight was playing on a Game Boy uh, Tetris in one panel. Ding 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 ding. ding. Uh, um, very good. I spy in the uh, this, this is outside of the story. I spy in the letters page of issue seven, chapter three. Uh, one of the uh, letterers, uh, one of the letter writers, asks about the end of uh, the first frontline arc, 
And the editor says, as I've said before, Larry Hama is hard at work on his creator-owned title Oxido, but who knows what the future holds? He may well return to these pages at a later date. Uh, Oxido is a creator-owned book that Larry Hama and Pablo Ramundi were developing for Devil's Due uh, that never uh, made it. Uh, and I believe uh, in the last couple of years, um, uh, Hama is is 100% disconnected from it, and Pablo Ramundi is uh, still trying to um, develop it somehow. I have seen a drawing of a cast of characters for this comic book that never quite happened. Um, I'm trying to remember if I saw it uh, on a wall in someone's like home, or I don't think we ever saw it, Mark, in the back of a Devil's Due comic. Doesn't ring a bell. Okay, yeah, I, th- I think sure. I saw this. I think I saw this at Larry Hama's home. Uh, you know, I did have uh, one more um, I Spy because uh, they point out the Cobra insignia oh, yes. in, the, yeah. in the paperwork. But earlier, there's a Mars logo on one of the monitors. Oh, I didn't spot that. Um, uh, let me see if it's in chapter one or two. It's on one of the blue pages. Yeah. Uh, issue five, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It's in the second flashback. Uh, it's the panel with the, the hand oh, yes. uh, using yeah, a computer yeah. mouse uh, very badly. That's that's not how you, not how you <laughs> use a mouse. No one uses a mouse sideways, Drew Johnson. So I think that might be um, that might be telegraphing that like there is going to be some kind of Cobra involvement later, which we do get the Cobra logo in the paperwork. Mm-hmm. But this may this may also just be a small comment on the fact that Mars sells to a lot of companies and countries and yeah. people. Yeah, the the cobra the cobra logo doesn't really sort of go much really any further beyond that kind of Easter egg element of having it on a file, does it? That it's it kind of just alludes to the fact that the, these scientists have been corrupted to to kind of develop this technology in a un, un, yeah unorthodox, unethical way, perhaps in part because of cobra involvement. Uh, and on the on the previous page, uh, the page before the Mars logo, oh. uh, there are some there 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 are two coloring things I don't like about this uh, arc, though I I do like J D Mettler's work on top of uh, Tony Harris right like that Spider Man miniseries they did but uh, the the panel where Duke says I was the only survivor um, there are there are little highlights on Lifeline's helmet and. Mm. Scarlet's shoulder pads and Snake Eyes' sword and his um, visor. And it's like, you guys are inside and these are fluorescent lights. It's like, is, are Lifeline's white goggles like made out of like shiny white chrome? No. Like 2003 coloring. Like things don't need uh, highlights. Also, um, flick when back, they start... You flick back one page as well. And the, these um, this coffee dispenser is like super shiny. No, yeah, uh, it's the most uh, important uh, thing in the room. <laughs> you you just stole the line from my from my brain because I was going to say that because the 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 this this two page spread where we see the team and these I was going to say those exact words the coffee and then the most important oh that's great um, <laughs> it's uh, all, it's your influence you've you've corrupted my mind Tim um, my second uh, comment about the the coloring is that in I think it's in the second chapter. Uh, when they go into the base and they start firing at the monsters, um, initially they have their flashlights, and their flashlights in chapter one and two are colored with lens flares. And once they pull out their pistols, the um, the muzzle flash of their pistols is also colored with lens flares. But guns firing bullets like that's not a flashlight, so that would not create a lens flare. Uh, yeah, uh, chapter six. Uh, is it page 13? I did write it down. Okay, yeah, it's a sort of, sort of like a lighting effect. Around it. Yeah, the, it's, when they're it's saying the page open on the fire. R- yeah, open fire. So, like, that's, that, like, if those guns, like, had, like, light bulbs on the fronts, or, like, camera flashes, and the light, like, blinked when it fired a bullet in that first panel, yes, you'd get that sort of diagonal effect. And then that halo, the circle around mm, it in yeah. panels one and two. J.D. Mettler uh, turned into a fine colorist. Uh, there's, a, there's a little too much K, there's a little bit too much black in in um, many of these scenes. But 
so that you know this is a pretty good looking um comic story but uh, uh guns guns are not flashlights um dan did you have any easter eggs uh in 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 this story that that we've we've not talked about uh <laughs> i don't none that i can think of none none that i can remember i mean uh, this this has been a really cool journey down memory lane, uh, but uh, yeah, like you know, you were saying it's almost twenty years ago, and boy, I've written a lot of stories since then. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I meant to ask earlier, but um, uh, somehow forgot, was um, I've heard the other side of the story from Br- uh, Brandon Jerwa about um, the the sort of that that short list um, exercise for for pitching the the ongoing G.I. Joe book. And as he tells it, uh, he, he found out that you were the, the, the other person on the short list and was so excited because he thought you you were such a great writer that he immediately <laughs> reached out to, to talk to you about how it was all, uh, you know, how it's all going and sort of just, yeah, sort of with that <laughs> enthusiasm. Um, what was it like being on the receiving end of of that slightly weird uh, <laughs> communication. Um, I, I love Brandon. Uh, we've been friends since that contact. Uh, you know, I hang out with him at cons every chance. I, I, in fact, uh, my wife and I had a trip planned to Seattle to hang out with him. Uh, it was we were going to go in fall of 2020. And, you know, circumstances involving viruses and whatnot got in the way of that. Um, but uh, Brandon is awesome, and uh, I look forward to hanging out with him whenever I can, whenever that's, whenever that's you know, travel and other circumstances permit. <laughs> Very good. Um, I, have, I have one last uh, negative note and one last positive note. Um, for for my thoughts on these four issues uh, to start with the negative there are two lines in this story um, it's sort of about snake eyes is coolness <laughs> where uh, in in issue seven chapter uh, three uh, page 12 frostbite says I'm never going to be as cool as he is am I he says this to scarlet and she says no and then in the final chapter uh, airtight at the end says uh, after he's rescued Duke maybe I'm not so completely uh, maybe not completely useless after all and uh, that the first bit with snake eyes um, strikes me as a little external because uh, I we all know as readers and fans that snake eyes is the coolest I feel like if you're <laughs> if you're a Joe in the real world it's not like you feel inferior to him it's the opposite it's that you are just so excited to have such uh, a loyal, uh, expert on your team and you're all gonna like do your best for each other um and then sort of this bit with with airtight at the end like i feel like that's external where it's like kids holding an action figure like what do i do with airtight <laughs> like his helmet doesn't come off and he's only for when there's like toxic gas it's like well i don't play my gi joe toy games with toxic gas i have like <laughs> guys shoot each other with these like fake little guns so it's like well i got airtight for my birthday that's a useless figure uh, and he's only in one. Well, he's only in two episodes. Um, and I think, uh, I think the, the the dialogue in the first chapter, where this is the one team, this is the best team for this mission, negates the need for airtight to say, "I guess I wasn't. I guess I was needed on this mission after all." It's like, no, we've already established that this may be a biohazard environment. We definitely need airtight. Um, so, from the logic of the moment, yes, I'm glad Air- airtight has that spare. Um, like mask for Duke to get out of the steam or gas or sadness cloud. Um, (laughs) But uh, uh, I didn't, I didn't need airtight to like bash himself for the sake of me as the reader. But there are lots of lines in this that I really like Um, in, in issue six, chapter two, when lifeline talks about why Duke left him behind, like the four Joes go into the hole in the ground and Duke's like, no, 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 uh, lifeline, you stay here with airtight. And then, Life, uh, Lifeline says to Airtight, "No, he left me here because I might turn into a werewolf, <laughs> right?" And sorry, I'm sorry, I'm making that a joke, but, uh, but in in the moment, um, it's a great line, and it, it things turn really serious for that moment, and I'm suddenly worried about him and Airtight, and also like, oh, Duke, how could you be so cold? But yeah, 
Lifeline did get maybe sort of slashed by one of these monsters, he might he might turn into one. Um, and uh, the final page of the final chapter, there's a nice sort of uh, denouement. And, you know, we get this last bit about uh, Lifeline uh, being OK and Duke has the final word. Uh, I, I don't. I don't love how uh, uh, Javier Pina draws the snowcat like backed up against the door of this base. I would have put it sideways because I feel like uh, it's not anyway. But um, so shake your leg. Let's move. It's cold out here. Um, Duke getting the final say in this in this scene in this story arc where uh, sort of he's put through the emotional ringer because he has to confront this mission that he failed on and he gets everyone out, including. Um, the British uh, rock climber. Mr. Trellis. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, the ending, you know, ending a story is hard to do. Ending it in a way that doesn't feel, uh, you know, trite or convenient uh, is also hard to do. And uh, I sort of wanted for like logic's sake, sort of wanted there to be more story with Lifeline getting injured. Um, and, you know, on the final page, Duke hands him this chit and says, oh, no, no, your po- your test came back negative. Um, and, you know, like, life it's not going to be an ongoing story point where Lifeline's, like, confined to headquarters for a year and there's, you know, some, like, scene where we check in in the main book or another frontline arc where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, Lifeline might turn into a polar bear, so we have to keep him inside. <laughs> um, so the story is, what I'm trying to say is the story wraps up nicely. I think I knew that the final line of dialogue was going to be, it's cold out here. <laughs> like, when I started writing the scripts, um, I, I really, I, I like to know how something is going to end. Even if I have not really much of an idea what happens between the beginning and the end, I really like to know what the last line of dialogue is in a story, if, if, I, can, if I can make that work. And... Um, so it's it's kind of like I was just building toward that the whole time. So I'm uh, glad you liked it. And for the parts that, that you didn't like, it, yeah, yeah, it's good points. <laughs> that was 20, I, I, year, 20 years ago, me. <laughs> yeah. uh, that guy sucks. I, <laughs> I, 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 will, I will add for the historical record. Um, so Dan, Mark knows this. Uh, I'm... I'm a very big G.I. Joe fan. I was very invested in the comics, and when Devil's Due brought them back, I was excited. But I, I, I jumped ship after Blaylock's second or third arc because I, I didn't think the book was, was great. Um, but Frontline was this opportunity to have other writers tell new G.I. Joe stories, particularly the initial arc uh, by Larry Hama, right, the writer of record. Um, and uh, I really liked this arc at the time that it uh it stepped away from cobra it didn't involve any of blaylock's um ongoing plot threads uh it was sort of a it was a self-contained story but i will be honest um the 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 arc after this as as advertised on the back cover of dan your final issue was to, was to feature a character for whom i didn't care and uh your issue was my final uh, G.I. Joe Frontline issue. I had I had jumped ship on the Blaylock book, and with the end of Icebound, I jumped ship on Frontline. Well, I'm glad to have been along with you on that journey. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I think we've we've eaten up huge amounts of your time, Dan. So so I'm sort of yeah, just to give you a final opportunity for final thoughts and, and also to to you know promo the things that you're working on at the moment and and where people can find you and and that kind of stuff. I don't know as far as as far as Icebound uh you know it, it was I all of a sudden I had the, the chance to play with these toys in a, a you know a professional setting that I had basically played with as a as a kid. You know there there's two sides of the coin there are people who say oh i don't want to work on anything that i didn't create because you know i don't i don't control it i don't have uh, the final say you know it's 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 not my character i just want to do stuff that's original to me and there's a lot to be said for doing original stuff it's what i'm doing now but um being able to step in and actually contribute to the canon 
of something that you loved as a kid or you loved as an adult. Uh, you know, at, at one point for Dark Horse, I got to write a really short Star Wars story. And uh, there's really nothing like stepping into a universe that you already know and that you love and being able to contribute to it. So, you know, I was just thrilled beyond imaginings when, when Devil's Do said, uh, yes, we like the sound of this project, go write some G.I. Joe. And, you know, the, the only thing that I would do differently about it now, uh, I would like to think that over the last 20 years I've become a better writer. <laughs> so, you know, I would like to, if I, you know, if, if I could, and not that I'm going to, but if, if, I were given, <laughs> if I were given the chance to do this again, I would like to think that I, would, that I could do it better now. So, you know, I'm just basically grateful to the G.I. Joe universe as a whole for letting me play in their sandbox. As far as where you can find me, it's uh, I'm at danjolly.com, and that's uh, D-A-N-J-O-L-L-E-Y dot com. And um, these days I am primarily a novelist. I've got, uh, it's, <laughs> I, I can't seem to settle on a genre I have, um, I've done some stuff for kids, got some kids urban fantasy type material, and then for uh, adult audiences, I've got a uh, science fiction superhero trilogy called the Grey Widow Trilogy, have my uh, first ever mystery thriller out now called The Storm, and my first ever fantasy novel comes out on October 15th. Uh, that is a hybrid... Uh, fantasy detective novel called The Rune Master Homicide that I'm really, really excited about. So if you go to danjolly.com, you can see everything I've ever done, and you get a, a preview of The Rune Master Homicide. I've got the whole first chapter there uh, for anybody to read. And uh, if you sign up for my newsletter, uh, which is called Sequential Dan... And that's that's me, like in the photo comic strip format, giving you information that comes out once a month. And if you sign up for that, then you get a free ten thousand word short story that I wrote specifically for uh, the subscribers. You can't get that anywhere else. And uh, that's a story called "The Last of the Electric Knights," which is about a uh, a, a twenty automata uh, automatons. However, the, uh, they're robots. The robots <laughs> that, that were built by uh, Nikola Tesla after he accidentally fractured the walls between realities. And uh, these are uh, guardians of this world who uh, track down entities that have come through and uh, inhabited and corrupted creatures and people from, from this world. Uh, it's... Uh, it's a little bit out there, but it's really good, and I think you'll I think you'll like it if you give it a shot. Dan, are you on social media? Are there other places people can find you? Um, I'm kind of a geezer, and so I'm mostly on Facebook. <laughs> you can find me on Facebook, uh, and uh, I do have a Twitter account that I sometimes use, and I have an Instagram account that I haven't really used much. I'm. Uh, I need to get one of the younger members of my family to, to give me a little Instagram coaching so I, uh, I can do that better. Uh, but yeah, Facebook mainly. And, you know, if you feel like uh, sending me a direct message or whatever, I respond to uh, anybody that reaches out. Yes, I'm, I'm aware of this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was a quick response. I was amazed. <laughs> Listeners, you too can bother Dan Jolly. <laughs> So, Dan, thanks so much for entertaining us uh, with this arc back in 2003. Uh, and present day, Dan, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time uh, to, to, you know, to talk us through, uh, you know, the, the details and all about what was happening back uh, back in writing for Devil's Due back in the day. So it's a, it's been a, a thrill to, to, you know, get all of that uh insight uh, and you know really sort of enrich this uh, you know the whole process of looking back on uh, back on these these issues so uh yeah thank you for for your time it was great for for you to join us uh thanks for having me
Thank you for th- thank you for taking my my light punches and uh, oh uh, th- thank thank you for thanking for taking the time and and for answering our questions. Oh this no, no problem. This is this has been fun. Should we do? Should we yo Joeage? It do you think? Sure, sure. Um, so it's a tricky one. I enjoyed it. I liked I liked this sort of foray into you know the what if GI Joe met the thing. I think I've got a a slight inclination to to sort of shy away from my version of gi joe sort of you know veering towards the monsters and the supernatural i you know sort of prefer the slightly more you know militaristic you know slightly more real worldy stuff um which probably distracts from my my score the art is very solid i really like the covers particularly the first couple of covers so, so yeah, I think some something like a seven for for these. Um, the monster stuff. Uh, I don't think it should be in a GI Joe comic, but if a GI Joe comic is going to feel more like the cartoon and less like the comic, I like it how it does it here more plainly. Whereas the Blaylock run for the first two years, uh, it's like very clearly he's like nodding to the TV show. Um, and I, you know, I don't think like polar bears, polar bear men or like werewolves would show up in the Larry Hama comic. And I, I haven't, I haven't read the, um, Falcon nemesis enforcer toy packing comic that Larry Hama wrote around, what was it? 2010 or something. So, uh, sorry. What I mean to say is I give this a six. I would give this a seven if the. The colors were a little less um, busy with all of the like water splatter patterns, all the texturing, um, particularly in the final chapter. There's there's a little too much K. There's too much black in the like scenes inside Joe headquarters and in the cockpit of the the snowcat. Um, this loses some points for having an art cha- an art team change in the final chapter, even though the art is good. I think some of the some of the penciling, some of the I think Drew some of Drew Johnson's like action panels. There are a couple panels in like chapter two and three and four where the Joes are like running from one room to another and the monsters are chasing them. And uh, just subtly, he doesn't pick the the most dramatic camera angle. Cam, you know, like there the, there could be more oomph to it. And um, there's something a little um, a little I don't quite have the word for it, but sort of these are not the right words dry and flat in the inking i I really see it um in i think chapter three there are some diagonal patterns that are inked into the ice formations um and i think sometimes the inking treats every material the same whether it's like a leather pouch a jacket uh, a big chunk of ice so i'd like a little more differentiation in the inking you know as for story you know, if a few things were a little different, this would be a seven. I think overall, this is a, a good story and it, it does wrap up nicely. Um, but there, you know, it's like some of the bits of dialogue drag this down, like the comments that I made. So I'll give this a six. But uh, I did like the story when I read it. But this was the final arc of, of Frontline that I read because I was not interested in in the spotlight shining on Zanya for two issues um, after this. And had this team... I should I should add, had Jolly and Drew Johnson taken over the main book at issue twenty six, I would have hopped back on. Oh, interesting. Um, it's it's probably worth calling out as well that um, Larry Hammer did work uh, work on a book called Spooks, which is a kind of military versus supernatural book, and indeed features werewolves. I don't know if you you've ever read this. This this is Four Devils, do right. Um, this was yes. this was developed by Robert Salvatore, mm-hmm. uh, the guy who's written a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons novels, and I think his son, and I think like so another writer, and I think the the development was brought to Hama and it, it, like that Devils do, uh, and it it didn't run very long. Uh, there are only um, there are only four issues of it. Oh right, okay. Uh, and the second series went for four issues okay so yes uh hama did write yes you make you make a good point um that it's uh it's it's not like out of his um 
it's not it's out of his gi joe like oeuvre but it's not out of his oeuvre yeah so uh next time on talking joe disavowed we will be looking at gi joe frontline issue nine to ten which is called family history and shines a spotlight on zanya it is the book that broke Tim back in 2003 and decided that he would throw the comics out of the window and stop collecting them. But uh, so what shall we think uh, almost 20 years on when he actually gives them a chance and reads through them back over on the regular show, we will be continuing to cover the uh, real American hero issues as they come out. We've just concluded murder by assassination and uh, heading on into the spotlight issues uh, with um, Storm Shadow taking the first spotlight in issue 286. And then we'll have all sorts of other bonus shows like uh, looking at people's art collections in between. So keep an eye out on the YouTube, collect, uh, keep an eye out on the YouTube channels. Uh, Tim, where can people find you? Uh, my store, Hub Comics, is open seven days a week. That's in Somerville, Massachusetts. So, hubcomics.com. Uh, I'm at a realamericanbook.com, and I'm also on Facebook. Excellent. And continuing to drop great nuggets like your recent look at the designs by Ron Rudat for Torch. Uh, fascinating stuff. So you can find us uh, on the show at the usual places. Those places are listed at talkingjoe.co.uk, the website. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email. We're also on Patreon at patreon.com talkingjoe. So if you're enjoying the show and want to contribute, then feel free to do so. A big thanks to all of our backers, Richard, Sam, Jay, Bill, Christopher and Justin, who are all getting early access to episodes as well as exclusive content. So I think that is us done. But remember, nobody is talking Joe, a real American podcast. Also, including a guy from England. Latest tomatoes. And we are done. Uh, I feel a little bad being so nice and complimentary while we're talking to uh, Dan Jolly, and then I only give it a six.